So I'll briefly introduce Fat Pencil Studio. This is a company that I started in 2004, at that time mainly doing renderings for real estate developers. And we've evolved into a kind of a consulting firm, and we do a lot of visual stories for uh, helping clients explain complex projects and technical projects. As you see at the bottom here, the industries that we work in right now are primarily construction, transportation engineering, uh, litigation is something that we've been working on for about five or six years now. That's another whole interesting story how we got into that. But what I want to focus on today is this question of extremely large models. Now, it's 4.30 in the afternoon, so uh, you know, I know it's not the primary time to be focused. But you know, take a second, stretch out. We're going to have some fun today. We're going to do it quickly because there's a possibility of needing to get people up the hill a little sooner than we had expected. So I'm going to move fairly quick. If you do have a question, hold on to it because I will probably stick around afterwards and I'd be happy to talk if you don't get a question answered during the session here. And I want to start with a story. And this is a story about a project that I had the opportunity to start in 2010. It's a streetcar line in Seattle. It was an extension of an existing streetcar line in South Lake Union. They are adding uh, and have now finished adding 2.5 miles to the line. Um, if you're familiar with uh, Seattle, it's up on uh, Broadway at First Hill. And the uh, story is that the uh, project was being done in 2D. They had construction documents and design and engineering documents. They needed some 3D, uh, 3D visuals to go into an environmental impact statement. And so we were hired to do some, um, you know, I think 15 or 16 locations along the line and figure out what are these things going to look like uh, when, when they're finished. And this, the, um, the, uh, loca the locations were sort of specified by the environmental impact statement. We had um, about, um, I don't know, three, two or three months to do this. And at the end, when we were kind of coming up on the deadline to get these turned in for the environmental impact statement, the model was getting very large. Um, I would say pushing 90 megabytes. And that's when we really started to have problems. Uh, a couple days before it was due, SketchUp was crashing every half an hour, and I started to get nervous. And you don't want to be nervous uh, in front of the client. There, were, there was definitely some late nights and hand wringing, but we did manage to figure out ways to get everything to export for the environmental impact statement. And I thought, well, we but dodged a bullet on that one, you know, have to think more carefully next time. And sure enough, in 2011, they came back and they would like, you know, they want to use this for more things. They want to use it for public outreach and streetscape design and collaboration with the architects that are doing the streetscape. And they want to use it for a design review. And they want to have more detail and more people and cars and street markings and station details. And I'm thinking, How's this going to happen? So I made the decision at that time, and you'll, you'll see some of the, what we came up with here. We had to start over from scratch, not the buildings. The buildings were, were fine. We were able to reuse the buildings. But everything else, because we, you know, we, we, we started, started talking about what had changed, and they said, well, we just made a few changes. And I said, well, where? How many? Well, you know, we checked the CAD file, 40 or 50 changes. And, and we really had to draw all from scratch in the CAD file, bring in all the new markings, too much had changed. And in order to do this and make it work, I, was, I had to become hyper attentive to what we were bringing into this model. Every component, how small could it be? And what we ended up with was a model that has a lot more detail, as you can see, but it was only about 50 megabytes and pretty smooth to work with. So that enabled not only the, uh, the, the exports to use for those variety of purposes, but also it enabled the uh, project team to use it during meetings and to um, try to work in real time with other stakeholders to get decisions about you know, what is this, what is this uh, plaza going to look like and you know, how can we do painting in the street. So I'm going to show you real quick what the model looks like in SketchUp. This is the full extent. It's about uh, 50 blocks or so. And we can kind of zoom into some different areas. So you can see it's, you know, it's, it's a little jerky, but not, not too bad. And if you, if you tap on the preset scenes, you can get relatively smooth animation. Uh, 
Okay. So what I want to do is talk about how we're going to learn. What do we learn from this? Let's, let's talk about that. So it's very easy, very easy indeed for the model to go to hell. That's what it comes down to. And you know, it, all it takes is adding a few cool details that the client wants, and it's okay to start over. And that's what we ended up doing. And I kind of call this one the born again model if you want to stick with the religious theme. But um, I didn't tell the client we were starting all over. They, didn't, they wouldn't have wanted to hear that perhaps, but it was the right thing to do rather than continuing to get really bad results with a, a model that was slowing down too much. And over the years, we've done a whole bunch of these big models. And I'm going to go through with you as many of the tips as we could fit into a fairly short presentation today. And so let's start by, um, oh, here's the, this, is the, uh, this is the alternate title for today's presentation. <laughs> it didn't make it into the program, unfortunately. But this is what you can think about the next time you start a project. So I'm going to go through today, what are the problems that you run into in a big model? And most of these will be familiar to you, but you might, if you haven't seen them before, you're going you're to hear about it now. And then we'll spend most of our time talking about these individual strategies, and at the end have time, hopefully, for a bit of inspiration around uh, what's possible and how big you can get. So let's talk first about problems. And uh, how many people here um, remember Family Feud? I guess it's still on. That's it? Are you, are you guys sleeping out there? OK, all right. So here's the deal. We asked 100 SketchUp modelers. What is the most frustrating thing about creating large site models? I'm going to go with the, through the top five answers with you. And you know the drill, right? You got to complete the sentence when you see it on screen. So you, uh, you add a bunch of components to start to orbit. Everything's going wireframe. And that model is redrawing too slow. Too slow. Pretty sleepy out there. All right, we can do better than that. Let's try the next one. A uh, huge time investment that you put into accurate terrain, right? You're very excited, and then it turns out really ugly. Yeah, you've seen that one maybe? Okay. What about you zoom in to a particular detail with a client, suddenly it disappears in front of your eyes. Are you crazy? No, it's just clipping. Yeah. You've got a deadline. In about 15 minutes, you go to export, and suddenly... All right, and number five, every time you autosave, you have to wait for. <laughs> and you wait for a long time, that's true. So all these things combined, it can start to try your sanity a little bit. And what I'm going to give you today is some, some uh, tools to combat that, so you'll feel more confident going into your next site modeling effort. So you'll say yes un unconditionally. And, and hopefully not get into too much trouble. So there's, let's start with the, the one strategy. This is the one strategy to rule them all. Are you ready? <laughs> uh, well, uh, you know, this has been, uh, I've overheard this at my office a number of times with these things. But no, really, it, it stands for um, where's the focus, all right? So when you start, it's really important to figure out what do people need to learn from this model. Because you can put detail everywhere, and you're going to quickly end up getting too big. But if you know what you're focusing on, and you know what you're trying to convey, and you know the story that you need to tell up front, you can make good choices about where to add your detail. And the rest of it is kind of blurry. I mean, we've got the buildings there, and they need to be there for context, so you don't have flatlands out beyond the street but they don't need to have a ton of time or even that much hyper accuracy on them. So I'm going to talk about four different types of general st um, strategies. The first is terrain. I'm going to also go through roads, building, uh, an entourage, and a few other chips. But let's, let's start with terrain, area that has a lot of frustration. There's different ways to get terrain. And I'm going to go through each of them so you can kind of get a feel for what the um, options are. And the first is the simplest, right? You just go and you grab it from the geolocation option in SketchUp. And you get something that looks like this in your window. And it's got a mesh on there, a triangulated mesh. 
Um, one thing to keep in mind when you do this, those, those imports from SketchUp, they do tend to be a little bit saturated, pretty dark, and sometimes it's hard to see the things that you put on top. One thing we often do is just do a quick edit of that material to lighten it up, to desaturate and uh, increase the brightness. It's still all there, all the information is there, it's just easier to see whatever you're putting on top of it. All right. Another route that we use quite a bit is if, you're, if you have a mesh that already exists from another source. It could be a CAD file, could be uh, you know, some civil, civil 3D, a microstation, and you might get something like this. This is a roadway that we got on a survey, a survey um, that we got on a roadway project, and we needed to have more context than this road. So there's a desire to fit it in with the, the image that we have brought in from Google Earth, but the problem is they don't match up. Because Google Earth, I mean, it's good to within five feet or so, but when you get down to the, the exact numbers of, of Z, Z elevation, it just doesn't match up with the accurate survey. So the strategy there is that you need to find a way to put these things together. And what you see here is this offset that we've created between the imported elevation, or the imported survey, and the, sketch, the Google Earth terrain. And that provides an opportunity to knit it together. And I want to show you what that looks like. So let's switch over to SketchUp here. And go to that file. So to see this, we're going to have to turn on the hidden geometry. And you'll see all those dotted lines are the terrain mesh on top of the image. What's in white here is all the things that came in from the CAD program. And out here in blue is what's the you know, more regular, larger scale mesh that came in from Google Earth. And here's the little knitting that happened. So we've got an edge of each one, and those two edges, you can knit those together automatically by doing a build from contours. And then, I'll tell you what, this was a lot faster than trying to sit there and grab this edge and pull it over here. You know, I did do that once, and after a while I thought, you know, it's probably another way, it's not gonna take six hours. Uh, so that, you, know, you learn little tricks like this along the way, and it's, it's, uh, it makes me feel kind of like a you know, crafty a little knitting project. Um, <laughs> Now let's get back to, to here. So this is the, the third way, and if you don't have, uh, if you have contours, but maybe they're on a PDF and you had to import them just, just the line work, this is an option that you can consider. You've got a file that looks like this. You've got your, your topo lines, and you make sure you raise them up to the regular amount. So if you've got five foot topo lines, you want to make sure that they're spaced five feet apart in 3D. And then, you may get something that looks like this, so it's not flat anymore, it's just a 3D topo file, and you can generate this mesh using the SketchUp Generate from Contours, which you'll find in the Sandbox tools. And it looks kind of like this, it's a little bit ugly. And the reason, if you look at this mesh, is it's got a lot of irregularly spaced triangles and it's hard to shade it properly. And what you want is something like this, which is a nice regularly shaped mesh. And there's a couple plugins you can use to get that. Uh, one is called Instant Terrain, and you might have heard about these uh, instant family of plugins from Valley Architects. Very easy to use and handy. Another one that uh, doesn't cost anything uh, is this Terrain Reshaper, and you can get that at Sketchucation. And, and both essentially will sample the terrain that you have. Sometimes you have multiple terrains that you can sample and then create a single mesh from. And by the way, it's, it's really good, to, once you have that reference mesh that you're going to use for your project, it's really good to save that somewhere and only work on copies of that. Because I can't tell you how many times we've sit there, we'll punch holes in it, we'll operate on it, and then suddenly we, gotta, we made a mistake and we've got to go back, and there is no going back because we've, we've uh, destructively changed it. So it's really good to save that original mesh somewhere. Okay, you got a question? The five foot offset for the topo? Yeah, when you stitch it together. Um, we often do it manually. It's because you do have to select all those topos. Um, you know, th there may be a plugin for it though. If you had a lot of topo, it would certainly save time. So I'm going to give you one more strategy, which is something we've just started trying recently. This is uh, applicable to cities when you're working in a city with a street grid, and most often the intersections will be flat. And the rest of the streets might be sloped differently. And uh, you know, if you import a mesh from Google Earth, it's going to look like that. And it doesn't align with the street grid. And it's hard to work on it um, if you want to uh, move things around a little bit. 
So what I found out is that if you s assume that the intersections are flat, and you assume that the streets are a relatively constant slope between the intersections, you can come up with a radically simplified terrain grid, which is pretty darn accurate. I mean, it's, you know, for, for shorter, shorter streets, you know, it's probably about a constant slope. It does the job for what we need to do. And you can see here, we've got in the red area, those are the intersections that are flat, and the blue area are the constant slope streets. And it takes a little bit of doing to, you know, we, we were going into Google Earth and putting our mouse over the intersection to figure out what the elevation of each one was, and then drawing out those boxes in the appropriate place and putting them at the right elevation, and then hooking it up. There probably is a, you know, a way to do that faster, but we ended up doing it mostly manually for this project. But it came up with a much more simplified street grid. All right, we're moving into the next, the next thing here. And this is about roads. So I'm going to talk about a few different things. The first thing I want to talk about is how do you actually come up with a good, um, consistent, and easy to, to draw way of doing roads. If you just try to trace off an aerial, there's a lot of stuff in the way, right? You've got your trees in the way. Maybe it's kind of, when you zoom in, it's a little blurry, so you're not sure where the curb is. And I, we had a project where we traced the roads, and then they didn't end up being exactly um, parallel to each other, and that was a big problem. So what I have learned to do is where you can find it, in this, most cities you can find these, is go off the tax maps. Now, the tax maps are very regular, and they tell you what the right-of-way is and the property sizes, and they usually are pretty darn parallel to each other. It doesn't give you where the curb is, but this is, this is what we start from. This is, this is our base. And then it's just a matter of going in and figuring out how wide is the sidewalk at a location. And you can do that by kind of poking around in Google Earth and figuring out what the best place to measure a street width is. Or you can just go out and measure it uh, yourself or use data that you have from another partner. But always having a good, solid, um, correct base to start with as a reference is a really big help. And then another thing we've learned is that you really, uh, you, once you have the line work for your streets, it's important to preserve that. And I'll, I'll show you where that exists in this model, if I can open it back up here. Uh, let's turn on the bird's eye, and so I've got it here on a Z layer. Where is that roadway? It's up here. So this is a flat trace of the road. And we'll do a lot of things with that. You know, we'll drape it over terrain. Um, you know, draw, put, put in the traffic and drop it to the terrain, that kind of thing. And again, we, we try to preserve that somewhere in the model for a reference so we know we're always going off of the clean trace. And that's usually on a, on a reference layer that we can hide easily. Oh yeah, uh, now we get to talk about striping. I think the first time we did a project like this, I, I was thinking, do I really have to trace all of that? You know, couldn't we just get an image of it or something like that? And the thing is, when you, when you have an aerial photo, the striping's on there, so it's good for reference, but it is very blurry when you get in close like this. So it's important to trace the striping, and it's also important to apply a little bit of intelligence. Does anyone here know how wide stripes are on a, on a street? Yes. Four inches? Four inches for what? What kind of stripes? Center lines of four inches, and uh, also the white stripes dividing lanes of four inches. Let me go back over to here so you can, we can see a little bit more. We're going to get rid of the hidden geometry, go down to here. So there's also li fog lines on the edge. You know, those will, those will tend to be, these are, uh, I think these are four. But in the city, you sometimes see them as eight, separating a bike lane from a travel lane, and then four on the edge if there's a fog line. And then if there's a stop line or a crosswalk, these will tend to be 12. And so knowing those is uh, really important to being able to have it look accurate. You don't want to trace it and think it's, well, I'll just trace it and hopefully it's about right. Later on, that'll come back and bite you. So know what they are and just draw them that way, even if it doesn't quite look that way in the aerial photograph. Those things are blurry anyway. So uh, applying a little intelligence helps in a big way. And let's see what else we got here. Curbs and ramps. Let's go to um, 
Let's go to the streetcar model for that. Lots of curbs in here. So on a flat model, curbs are pretty easy, right? You know, you just draw your blocks, push, pull up six, six inches. But on a model that's got terrain, it's a little more complicated. You can't do that so easily. So what we've found is there's a plugin called Projections, and I'll show a reference for that later on, that you can use to take a surface and just project the thing <coughs> on the z-axis, and, and then it creates that edge there that you see at the curb. And that was a big time saver for us after I figured that one out. The, um, the ramps, we generally just do um, manually once we get the curbs all in there. So we can come back to this model later, but I want to move along and make sure we get to cover most of the tips uh, before possibly needing to end early today, depending on the weather. So let's, let's get to the next subject, which is buildings. So we use three primary ways of getting buildings into models. And there are others that, um, that cost more money, but these tend to be uh, very inexpensive, like free, uh, except for just the time to do them. So for, for most projects, this has served us well. Uh, and the first is just doing it manually. And today, in most cities, you can get a reasonable aerial photograph or Google Earth 3D model coverage uh, that you can see most sides of the buildings and then on, from the street level it helps you, know, you need to figure out what does it look like at the street level and what are the you know the details that you want to model so you can move around and applying a little intelligence you know how many floors is it if it's 12 floors it might be about 120 feet or so that's often good enough for the kinds of context modeling that we're concerned with it wouldn't be good enough if we were working with construction or architecture but if it's just providing context for what's happening elsewhere in the model, it's pretty good. If you need to be a little more accurate, you can get photographs and paste them onto the surface. And if you've got good scale photographs, that'll help you adjust to the exact positions of the windows, but it's slower. So sometimes just looking at it and drawing what you think you see um, is good enough and it's very fast. But when you have a lot of buildings, it's always a good idea to look for shortcuts. And the first one here, which sadly is no longer available, is just to try to grab as many buildings from Google Earth as you can and strip off all of the textures. But after uh, SketchUp went over to Trimble, most of the buildings that were uh, in 3D Warehouse that were generated not by SketchUp users, but by in internally by Google, those uh, did not come over uh, with, the, with the sale to the 3D Warehouse. So now you can still get buildings in the 3D Warehouse, but only the ones that were modeled by individual SketchUp users and not by computers or by teams of people that were paid by Google. Um, but still, it's worth looking because sometimes you can pick up some good buildings, particularly the ones that might be kind of landmarks, you know, like a performing center, a performing arts center, a stadium, a church. Those can be things that really um, make the model pop. And uh, maybe if you don't have to model them yourself or you can do some minor adjustments, that's helpful. And then a third method that's worth considering is GIS. And you often have, through um, geographic information services in a city, footprints of buildings. And in some cases, you have not just the footprint information, but also the average height of those buildings. And you can use that to um, bring the line work into SketchUp and then quickly pop up each building the correct amount. Again, it's not perhaps as accurate as you know, going out there and giving a close look at each building. But if you have to do hundreds of buildings, it can be a good, uh, a good shortcut. All right, so the last main topic I want to go over is entourage, uh, but, but not these guys. Uh, I want to go through this kind of entourage. And these are the things that can really bog down the model when you start adding things. So one of the, I guess the two biggest offenders are, are trees and cars, because everybody wants lots of trees and cars in the models. And you know, here's a SketchUp file. We put a tree and a car in there, and it's 10 megabytes right by itself. So we don't want to put a lot of copies of that thing, because very quickly you're going to get the, uh, the slow you know, um, wireframe components orbiting around. And you can get a similar effect with lower poly components. And you can see here we can get down to 184 kilobyte. It's still a tree in a car. And for certain uh, situations, this might be all you need to just convey the idea 
but you know, you've got some, some uh, streetscape, you've got some, uh, some activity on these streets. In other situations where you want to go to a more complicated, um, more photorealistic rendering afterwards, you can always use these as placeholder components and then swap out more, um, uh, more highly detailed components later. So let me, let me switch over to a couple other models. I'm going to close these. I want to open um, uh, some small models to demonstrate different types of trees because this is something that confused me quite a bit when I first started. And, and that is, um, what's the difference between a 2D tree and a 2.5D tree? Has anyone here heard of 2.5D trees? I was like, what the heck is that? Um, so I'm going to show you, and so you get a sense for what that is. Let's go and open this up. 2.5, so we want these two here. Okay, here's some trees. These are 2D trees in the front. They do face the camera. So as you turn around, they face the camera. But when you go up here, it doesn't look so good. So if you're doing a lot of aerial views, you're going to get these sort of foreshortened things. And you can play little games like, for example, adding a, a top view layer, which looks like uh, that. So if you do go to top view, then you could, you know, turn on and turn off your vertical and, you know, get a sort of a landscape-y looking thing. But it is not great if you're going to be doing a lot of this aerial view. And that's where these 2.5D trees come in handy or the full 3D trees. So um, these are some things that I got from uh, Tom's Drop, which is a, a guy I found out through Sketchication. He does these great trees that are made up, and you can sort of see them when you look at them below, because they don't face me when you're, when you're below them. They have these, these little uh, tufts of foliage that face the camera whenever you're both either above or... So, it, you know, even from above, it looks pretty decent. And he's got some shadow casting surfaces in there, so when you turn on the shadows, they still look, even though they've got just those funny angled foliage, it still has a reasonable shadow. And then over here with the 3D trees, they look pretty nice, but if you start putting a lot of these babies in the model, you can expect some slowdown. So that's, the, you know, you've got to think about what the trade-off is and how many of these items do you need to put in. Maybe there's just one block that you care a lot about and you put the nice trees there and then kind of uh, descope to some other not as fancy ones. Okay, now I'm going to talk about the other two uh, things that we, we put a lot of stuff in. So, you know, people always want to activate the street, right? Activate the, the, uh, the, the block. That means putting a lot of people in the model. And so, we, I like to rely on these very simple profile people. And they don't add a lot of overhead to the model. You, you can get tons of them. You could, of course, you could get them with beautifully painted SketchUp people like we saw this morning with the uh, 600 attendees graphic. Um, I, a lot of the work we're doing, we're focused more on the street. So I don't like to paint people, which would be a distraction, but they're there. And it's a lot lower poly count than, for example, a, a full 3D person that would quickly um, add up to quite a bit of uh, slow uh, detail for your model. Now, with, with the profile people, for the most part, you can have them be face me components and whatever angle you're looking at it, it, it it's okay. So you never really know for sure what direction a person's going to be walking or standing. So it, it doesn't look terribly out of the ordinary. That's not true of bicycle face me people. Uh, because they generally have a direction. So if I were, were to have this as a face me component and it's then pointing out into the street, that doesn't work so well. So in, in sometimes if we, can, if we know our camera angles, we might be able to get away with this cut out bicycle person. But more often than not, we have to resort to a 3D bicycle person. And so we spent some serious time trying to get a bicycle and a rider that was as limited geometry as possible. So we could still put a number of these in a model and not have it, not have it go to hell, basically. Okay. That's a good question. Do you want it? All right, so um, I can look at that. I'm open to sharing the bikes. We need more bikes in our models, for sure. 
Um, so I think that's most of what I got in Entourage. Let's see what's next. Trees, bikes, sources. I, I'd love to get some input. So these are sources that we use a lot. Has everyone heard of these three? Pretty much? Can I add anything to this slide? I mean, I think there's probably a lot that people know that I don't. And I'd be interested in seeing if anyone in the audience has suggestions of places where you found really good things to add to a site model. In the back. Oh, you're just taking a picture. Sometimes Turbo Squid. Turbo Squid? Yeah. Uh, they have a lot of paid models, and they have a lot of free models. They have three models. Yeah. Um, but the paid ones, and the paid ones can go anywhere from twenty bucks to eight hundred dollars, depending on how detailed it is. So we've used TurboSquid uh, on a regular basis, particularly for court cases. If you know somebody was driving a two thousand four uh, Yukon Denali um, with certain trim level, you can often find something that's almost exactly that on TurboSquid, and then make minor modifications. So if I paid hundred dollars for that instead of trying to, well, we couldn't begin to model that from scratch. So that can be a really good source to check, because um, you may have exactly what you need. Yes? I'm not really sure about street furniture, but uh, when it comes to regular furniture, there's the Podium Browser. Podium Browser? Yeah. And do you have to own Podium to get that? No, it's such a license. You have to uh, buy it separately. Okay. These probably fit mostly with the form fonts, because you know that form fonts is also a paid. Yes. There's a lot of manufacturers who put out a 3D and the DFX or the form of their yeah. product, mm -hmm. appliances and stuff, so you can make those. And are they things elsewhere besides the 3D warehouse? Uh, yeah, from, from directly from from the manufacturer. The manufacturer's website. Okay. That you'd have to. And I'll tell you, we use that strategy a lot. You know, we'll find something nice, but it's five megs. But I'll bet you in half an hour we could have it um, key in at 500K just by taking all the, all the guts out of it. Any more to add before we move on? Yes? Um, we use Dynascape a lot. Uh, Dynascape is able to get the 3D components. Especially today, we figured out that we can use Dynascape Connects in Lumia as well. Oh, yeah? So Dynascape, Plants, and Lumion, okay. They import Lumion, yeah. All right, so that's a good list. And there's always more things out there. And I encourage everyone to, if you are not already a member of Sketchucation, to participate in those forums and also the SketchUp forums because you know, sharing that knowledge and finding other little neat places to get components can be a real big help. 30 minutes? 30 minutes? Yeah. Oh, we, we're doing good then. We'll have time for some Q&A. Uh, so let's talk about extensions. I'm going to just briefly touch on four that we've used a lot. Uh, we talked about instant terrain. Instant road is something that you can save a lot of time with if you know you've got a, a winding road through a hill. Uh, this thing will make it much easier to get that in there. And it's got some nice parameters you can set, including shoulder and um, how to blend into the surrounding terrain. And it works really well. So we've, we've used that on a few projects. Uh, the path copy is something that's really important for us to get the uh, striping onto the, the street. So if you've got to put in a bunch of stripes down a road and you don't want to draw them all individually, you can set those up as objects or components and then just run them all down a path. Same goes for lighting and trees. And there's um, another thing that's important to know, when you bring in uh, line work from CAD or other sources, it may not come in as a polyline. It may come in as a lot of individual line segments. And it's really helpful to weld those line segments together into a polyline so it's easier to select them. And then there's some plugins uh, you know, in, in, in terrain operations that depend on having uh, polylines for those contours. So we will usually weld contour lines together before trying to go ahead and make terrain mesh. And then the last one I wanted to mention, I think I, I touched on it before, for making curbs and fences that, that uh, follow the terrain, but you want them to be projected straight up. 
Uh, this can be a really good uh, sketch. This is from the, the um, Sketchication store, and this is the, the projections <coughs> extensions. It gives you a lot of ways to, to take 3D surfaces up that you can't just extrude with a push-pull tool. Now, I've got some, a few more bonus uh, tips here. But before I get to this, I, I forgot to say one thing that I want to just mention about striping on the street. And that is that um, we first time I did this, I tried to just draw the striping directly on the street. And so I had one huge um, you know, long street with the striping all in there. And then I went in and colored each of the stripes individually with the paint bucket tool. And I realized my mistake pretty quickly because when I needed to change something, it was very difficult to select you know, in this one huge uh, massive geometry, the stripes to change. So now what we do is we will draw the street as one object and group that and then draw the striping separately and float that about an inch above the street. And you just never notice it really when you're up high. And even when you're kind of low and you sort of see it poking out a little bit, it's not very noticeable. The one thing you do need to do is you need to make sure you go and find that stripe. I'll show you an example here. Let's find this. Uh, find this, this model of the, okay, so here's a stripe. It's floating an inch above the street. And right now, if I turn on the shadows, you're probably gonna see that casting a shadow, right? So you don't really want the striping to cast a shadow on the street, that would be weird. Um, you can turn that off by going in here and saying, I don't want to cast shadows. It can still receive shadows, but now it's not casting them anymore. And so it still looks, it looks a lot more like a stripe now that it's not casting a shadow. Some rendering programs don't play well with that strategy. Um, and they don't have that option of configuring th objects to not to cast shadows or not cast shadows. So you have to be aware of that. You, you, know, you, you bring this out, like we use Visualizer sometimes, which is a great free, simple renderer. But it, it will cast shadows for the stripe regardless. Um, so it's just something to keep in mind, depending on whether you're going to be doing renderings. However, if you have all your stripes in one clean group, you can always move them back down later uh, at the end. Now, let's talk about layer naming. When you start adding a lot of things to your model, it can be really useful to just keep things organized. I'm not talking about 500 layers like you'd see in the CAD drawing, but just a way to start turning on and off your layers when the model gets large. And having them organized in a way that makes sense to you is really useful. Here we use numbers, but you don't have to use numbers. You can you know, organize by name and it sorts out al alphabetically, whatever works. Uh, but it's much faster to go on the fly and turn off layers so you can get a quicker uh, orbiting model that way. And a second tip, and this goes especially if you're talking about working with other people to help build a large file, is that it's helpful to have a master file that contains everything that's the current version and then have other individuals in your group collaborate on copies of that file. So, you, so I, I'm going to make have one person doing the blue buildings which are existing at this uh, zoo site, and someone else is doing the yellow buildings, which is new construction, and someone else might be working on the terrain a little bit. We can each save separate copies of the model, and you can sort of see that strategy here. There's the master, and then there's a bunch of other ones that we've saved out with different initials at the end. And as long as we keep the same axes in each model, it's very easy to bring the new stuff back into the master by doing a copy and a paste in place operation. So that's our poor man's version of version control. And it works pretty well for a small group. We're all in the same office. It, it, and I think you know, five, six years ago, there wasn't really another option for version control that I know of. Now we're starting to see more of that come online, which is great. But it's still a really quick and easy thing to do when you have just a few people working on a model. And as long as you kind of identify who is going to be in charge of making sure that master is up to date, it works out well. Here's one that's sort of the hidden scourge of, um, of site models. Let's say you want to model a large area and you need to see the details of the satellite photo. And so you want to bring in a bunch of different images to tile so you can actually see that detail, right? When you bring uh, something into SketchUp from the 3D warehouse, from uh, Google Earth, it's like 1,024 by 1,024 pixels. It's kind of low res. So you need to bring in a small area and tile a bunch of them together, right? But each of those things adds up to a huge amount of data. So like uh, these two files that you're just looking at, the one on the left was 23 megs just by itself, just those images and terrain. And um, on the other hand, the one on the right was 1.2 megs. 
And the, what, the strategy I used is I just went and I exported one big image from Google Earth. And then you know, it's, it's like 4,000 pixels. But you can save that at uh, JPEG quality 2 or something like that. And it turns into a very manageable file size. And as long as you're careful about scaling and positioning it, both in terms of the you know, location and, and the um, rotation, then you'll have that as an accurate base to work from. And it's much easier to see and also kind of lightweight on the model. But I always tell people, if you're going to get in the habit of scaling things that you're bringing in, the one thing you do not want to do is do what I call a short baseline scale. Like, oh, I measured this building and it's 40 feet wide. I'm going to scale off of that. Because your model, let's say this is um, 1,200 feet. Now you, what you really want to be doing is taking the longest possible baseline to, to measure from. And so what we'll often do is uh, find a point. Let's say I can like, find a point up here. I can, I can identify this thing. It's the edge of a building. I see that. And maybe down over here, I can identify another point. And then I measure, those t measure that in, in Google Earth, because you can use the, the ruler tool. And, uh, and then it's much easier to get a good scale. You want to say something about the weather? Okay. So uh, just finishing up this thought, we've got the one thing to keep in mind, if you bring in big images like this, you do need to go in, in to your OpenGL preference and set use maximum texture size. Otherwise, it'll look real blurry. Okay. So that's it for the tips. I can answer questions on them in a minute, but I do want to show before you leave a couple items for inspiration. And let's see, the streetcar model was about 50 blocks, right? So what do you think would be the upper limit on how many blocks would be feasible to model in SketchUp? 50. More than 50. <laughs> you, th you think that, could you, I could do more than 50, right? Yeah. You saw 50, it was fine. Could we do 100? Can we do 1,000? What do you think? Can we do 1,000 blocks? You guys are, you, I like this. Very open. I, th I was expecting some doubters. All right, well, I'm going to show you this model. It's um, all of downtown Portland. And I, I'm going to have to open it up here. So let me do that. Can you show that on the warehouse? No. <laughs> <laughs> it's not over 50 meg. I'll show it to you. But uh, it's, it was over 50 hours. <laughs> That's for sure. Um, so open the model here, PDX downtown. So we use the strategy that I was showing you with the um, radically simplifying the terrain in the, in the city grid. And let's see if we can turn on the uh, animations. Oh, we got that. Okay. So what you see in green here, we, we built this as part of an effort for a competition talking about a green loop in Portland. And so this is just identifying that loop. This is a model that's got a level of detail that would be useful for sort of concept, conceptual planning. And you can see all these streets, they, they, they're just right of way. They don't actually have all the sidewalk and streetscape in them. Um, so this is something you can use to visualize the entirety of downtown. But then when you want to get in and work on something at the block level, this might become a context model to a more detailed effort at, at, that, at that area. But it's still really helpful to start to think about, you know, um, if, you, if you're looking at, and you, you've probably seen these planning documents where people, they, the planners love to draw these big fat arrow lines on those documents. But it's always two dimensional. So it's hard to really understand how that relates to other landmarks and um, buildings and just, you know, the, this is the 3D feel of the city. So this is a tool that, that we can use for that level of effort. It's still relatively easy to um, maneuver because we haven't added any, any, um, any components, just, just the buildings. You can see a lot of them are just um, extruded footprints, but we did add a little bit more effort on some of the large, taller buildings. Uh, over here, you can see is the Rose Quarter and the, the Rose Garden and the Convention Center is, is over here. So a few things that are landmarks in Portland, we, there's a little more detail there. And the bridges, of course, are important for a city and, and the river. But just to give you a sense for what the, the, the terrain looks like in here, I'll, I'll show you. You can sort of see the, 
the river. There is a river bottom as well. So we, if we ever need to do something with, you know, it, just, it shows the river bottom, that's an option. We can cut a, a section through this. Um, a little slower when I turn the hidden geometry on. So I could come in here and do a section cut and move through. And you can see the river bottom there. How big is that file? So the file, I'll show you two things. Because there's two things about file size that matter. One thing is how big it is on disk. And that file is, you want to guess? What? 40, 40 megs? All right, let's see what it is. Um, I'll, I'll show you that in a minute. But on disk, the file is 40 megs. Who could guess that? You get a pencil afterwards. <laughs> All right. Um, and then the other thing you want to do is like you're, exactly what you're saying. You want to um, definitely check in the entity info and get your, um, sorry, in the model info and, get, and look at your statistics. And so here we've got um, 155K polys. So it's, it's pretty, it's still relatively reasonable for moving around. Yeah, question. Is it in here? Oh, I never saw that. There it is. 40 megs. I've learned something. Uh, has everyone here learned something? All right. Um, one more thing to show you, and that is a model that we built to go on top of this. And that is this one here. Um, looking more at a very specific site and what is going on with the traffic signals and the street markings in that area. And this one will take a minute because it's a little bit bigger. There's a lot of stuff in here. OK. So this is in an area that's newly developed. This bridge is new here. And so we went through. And according to the signal and uh, streetscape plans, added all the streetcar rails, all the striping, all the signals, and, and used it partly to build renderings. <coughs> but then the other thing we used it for, and this is I want to show this before we, we end here, is we used it to. Um, dump into a traffic simulation program called vSim. And here's what that looks like. And you know, for people used to using SketchUp, it's always fun to actually see all these things moving around. This is called a, a micro simulation. So it actually is looking at um, agent-based behavior. And each of the vehicles have rules that they operate under. And you know, it, it normally you know, runs, you can run it on a flat plane. But um, you can also bring in 3D models as a base. And it's obviously much more realistic when you, as far as the context when you do that. So we've done a lot of work like this. What's the traffic program? It's called vSIM. The, the, the manufacturer is PTV. It's a German company. And they have an um, uh, American um, affiliate in, in Portland that does uh, all the sales in the United States for uh, vSIM. And so it's, you know, this is what traffic engineers to use to figure out, you know, is this intersection working, and can we make it better? And so they can run these simulations and watch them run in real time and tweak it and see how that changes things. And so in that way, it's a lot like SketchUp, because you can see your results in real time and, and make decisions based on that. You don't have to run this for, for 20, uh, 20 hours and see what comes out. And with that, I will say um, thank you for coming. I'll ask your questions if you want, but if you want to get to the, um, the top of the hill. Uh,